we're starting this book of Philippians. And Philippians, by the way, is kind of a, uh, it's one of the letters, the epistles of Paul. And so, you know, these were letters that were written to be spoken out loud. There's something about hearing the word of God that's so important, especially go back to, we could go into Hebrew culture and, and how they would um, read the word and read it audibly. And in fact, um, you would have somebody whose job it was to read the word. And if they were to have issues or stumble, they could be fired from their job. <laughs> so um, we don't quite put that bit of ownership on the word today and reading the word, but Philippians is also kind of a devotional letter. And so there's something about reading this one, especially from start to end, that I would highly recommend that you do because it's structured a little different than some of the other letters. It's more devotional, less, you know, like Galatians was very, and Ephesians were very instructional. Um, Philippians, there's still a lot of instruction in it, but it is a devotional letter that is uh, easy to read from start to end and uh, kind of learn more about being in Christ. Good morning, Ray. So Philippians, Philippians chapter one, and we're just going to read two verses. We're just going to read the introduction today. Good morning, Pat. So here's what it says, Philippians one and two, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, Katie. So Philippians is one of the most joyful letters that Paul wrote, and it comes with a somber realization. You, you see, it was that time was running out. This was written by Paul probably towards the end of his life. They're not sure if it was the final Roman imprisonment or where it was, but it was nearing the end. He knew the end was coming. And there was a somber realization that time was running out. There's a sense of urgency for unity in this letter of Philippians. Good morning, Vicki. You know, Paul's writing with this end of time feeling. He's he's writing knowing he's nearing execution and he's writing knowing that the world is being a, is attacking the church, the body of Christ and you know, we could also kind of apply that to today, right? That we feel at times like the end of time is nearing and that uh, the world is attacking the church. Good morning, Robert. And so Paul is writing to kind of remind us what is the faith of the body of Christ and how do we maintain it? Like I said, Philippians is a devotional letter. It was written to a church without a synagogue. So most of the places Paul wrote, there was a Jewish synagogue and the believers would, as long as they were allowed, meet at the synagogue and meet in places like that. And, and they didn't have one in Philippi. There was no synagogue. It was started, good morning, Stan, started by Paul and Silas. So if you remember back to Acts 16, Paul and Silas, they cast a demon out of a... Uh, um, uh, a little girl, they're imprisoned, um, they sing, the walls fall down, the jailer and his entire family get saved. And that's one of the founding families of this church that they're writing to. So they're writing to a church that, I mean, you know, Paul, um, Paul knows them. He knows them very closely. Philippians is a Christ-dominated letter. Uh, Paul wants us to be Christ indwelt people is what he speaks about. So Paul begins with his greetings that we read here in verse one and two. And technically it's really the first six verses are all kind of a greeting, but we're just looking at the first two today. It's he's addressing the people that he knows. There, there's no need for credentials. Remember, he often would speak to his authority as an apostle, his credentials, and he gives no credentials here. He knows them that closely. They love him. There is no trying to convince them or needing to convince them of who he is or why he can speak with authority because they know him. They love him. Level five leaders right here, right? And so he writes to the saints, the holy ones. And we're going to come back to this idea and spend a lot of time on this idea of saints, but writes to the saints. And what's interesting is he doesn't write 
from St. Paul and St. Timothy. He writes to the saints from servant Paul and servant Timothy. He gives two addresses in Christ Jesus and in, in, in Philippi. He'll elaborate on the importance of that in chapter 2. He won't let them forget that they were called by God and they're at this time and at this place for a specific God-ordained purpose. He greeted them with the typical Pauline greeting, grace and peace. Peace, shalom, reminds us of Israel, and it connects to the Old Testament prophets, and then grace, that charis, charis is a, the Greek word, it's, it's a Christianized form of a Hellenistic greeting, um, which was actually sherian, um, so charis, sherian, um, Greek, a Greek greeting, Greek connection to the new covenant that we have in Christ Jesus. So he uses this word saints 60 times um, in, in the New Testament. The word saints is used. It's kind of a customary word to describe believers, to describe Christians. And 1 Corinthians 1, 2, the church is described as consisting of those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. The church belongs to God. That it's found in a given place that, you know, the church is, belongs to God, but it's found in a given place. So like ours is in Jefferson. This, you know, he's talks, writes to the church in Corinthians for, in Corinth for Corinthians and Philippi for Philippians and, you know, so on. And the members are in the church because they are in Christ first. There's an order of, uh, of order of things that he lays out that it, you're in Christ therefore you're in the church thus the saints are by the calling of God and we are the saints we as believers now it's kind of hard for us sometimes to think of ourselves as saints um it's one thing to think of saint mother teresa right or saint Teresa of Avila, or you know, you name your your favorite saint, uh, um, Saint Francis, or you know, name a favorite saint, Saint Paul. But in Scripture, the word saint wasn't applied in the way that we see often in the Catholic Church. Of well, they had to have proven a couple miracles, and they had to uh, you know do X X X and jump through hoops to be given this special title of saints. It's we are saints. But like we're going to talk about in a second, we're going to talk more about why we can be considered that because I don't, I don't look at myself as a saint. I don't believe myself as a saint because of that level, if I look at it that way. But we are saints because we are in Christ. We are in Christ. So saints point in one direction to what Christ has done for them. That's one of the keys of it. We point to what God has done for us, not what we have done for Christ, right? It's what God has done for us is what saints point to. They realize the obligation that we now have as believers to live out this position by God's strength. We are his ambassadors. We are his representation going out into a world that needs to know his hope. And so it's this Christian title of saints. The Greek word is hagios. Hagios, uh, it's a noun, it meant saint. As an adjective, it meant holy, right? So, I mean, does that give you a picture of anything, right? As a noun, it is saint. As an adjective, it is holy. Hebrew, the word is kodos, and it, or Kodos, kod, kodes, I guess is maybe more, probably more of a chodes, um, but it's separate. It's a part. That's where we kind of get that whole um, holy is to be separate, you know, um, called out. But it's not separate from what? See, that's often what we, we look at things when we look at ourselves as being separate. We often in the church spend too much time saying, well, we're to be separate from the church or from the world. We're to be separate. We're to be separate. 
and, and it wasn't this idea, the words didn't have this idea of a question of separate from what. It was the idea of separate to whom. Do you, you catch that? Who are you separate to? Not separate from something. Which, when you are separate from something, then you can start to get this superior complex, right? But we are separate to. We belong to a different order of things. We live in a different mindset, a fear of being in the heavenly realms in a way, right? It's the now and the not yet, that we are saved for heaven. We are ambassadors of Christ. Therefore, we belong to him, not to the world. That's this idea of saints. Remember, the adjective is holy. Holy and holiness, right, are, are those words that are the most intimate biblical words for the divine nature. For the very nature of God, right? Luke 135 talks about the power of the Most High is the Holy Spirit, and the Son of God is the Holy Child, right? Isaiah 6 3, Isaiah walks into God's presence and he hears the angels crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of hosts. And it describes this total, the totality of the nature of the divine is holiness of holy and it causes Isaiah to fall on his face to fall under deep conviction for sin it's kind of interesting that this word has both those meanings implied the bible underlines for us that the holiness of the lord is not only something true of his whole nature or something unique in its kind but it is also it, it, this idea of the, the moral perfection of his very nature and the ability for us to be morally perfected in sanctification in this journey. It, it's now a description of the Christian to be a saint, to be set apart, and to be holy. We are set apart unto holiness understand why sometimes we say that in the holiness background, right? We are set apart unto holiness. Holiness isn't just a checklist. We'll get to that in a second, but it's also who. Holiness and holy is the divine nature. We are set apart unto holiness in conduct, but also only because we are set apart unto the divine nature, which is holy. We are saints in Christ Jesus. We are saints in Christ Jesus. It's by itself, a saint could mean that it's by my strength, my will, my skills. But the truth is being a saint, being a believer, is a more in our position in Christ. It's a reliance on our position in Christ and his strength. It moves us away from ourselves and into him. We are saved unto holiness. Kind of three aspects of this idea is in, of, and from. In, in the words that he says here, that um, servant of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God. So the original is slaves in Christ Jesus. Okay. So the relationship that we have in, relationship in which we live, in Christ, salvation comes. That justification, the adoption, the atonement, it comes in Christ. This relationship in Christ allows us to grow in this act of sanctification, to grow in holiness. This relationship in Christ is what gives us assurance of our faith. To be in Christ is to have all we need for past, present, future, and eternal welfare. In Christ, putting off the old and putting on the new nature in Christ. Second is we have this relationship as servants of Christ. It's bought with a price. And 
basically means when you are bought with a price, you are at the mercy of the one you serve. You are at the mercy of the will of the master. That's why Paul so often used that term of slave or, we, you know, it's sometimes translated servants. But it's this concept that you were, your debt was paid and now you are at the mercy of the one who paid it. And we can't ever pay it back. You're bought with a price and at the mercy of the will of the master. But because of who our master is, that it gives us freedom. We are free, free from the penalty, free from the bondage, free from the power of sin and that act of initial sanctification that grows us towards further sanctification in Christ. We are free from the power of sin and death in our lives because we are servants of Christ. And because you are now in debt but free, <laughs> right? I mean, talk about concepts here. You're indebted, but yet you are more alive and more free than ever you were under the bondage and power and penalty of sin. It allows us to love Christ more, to grow in awe and wonder at his holiness, at his plan, at his very nature, and that causes us to grow in love and obedience. So when you are in Christ, it results in a love of obedience. We're called to obey. And then the third one is that he is a giver, the giver from whom we as Christians receive all good things. Paul uses that term grace and peace from God. So because you are in Christ, because you grow in your love for Christ, in obedience to Christ, then you grow in your grace and your peace. It's an attitude. Paul's attitude isn't man to man. He isn't writing about man to man in peace. He's not writing about scholar to a master. He is writing about a human being to the very God. The nature of very divine nature of God. That all divine love, grace, and peace is poured out from that divine nature to the saints, to the believers. It's a grace that moves us towards salvation and peace. Peace with God and self and others and with creation. And finally, we are, there's a, I guess I'm, I'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow and the meaning of those words because uh, it's kind of an interesting play on words that he does here. Um, yeah, I'll talk about it tomorrow with his I give thanks. But uh because in the Greek, uh, I'll just kind of tease it now. In the Greek, the word for grace, as I said, is charis, charis, something like that, C-H-A-R-I-S. But the word for give thanks is you charisto, you Christo. So it's charis in the middle of giving thanks. And so when it's, when it's this idea of an action from God to us, it's grace. But when it's from us to God... It's giving thanks. It's just this picture in this play. Paul loved to play on words. And so it's kind of just an interesting way that he took the same word and kept it as the root in the word for thanks. So grace and thanks. We are thankful because of the grace. It is a result of and a reaction from. But finally, we are in Christ. He is our setting. We are separate for his glory. We are separate for his will. We are separate for his plan. We are separate for his praise.
you know, in, in our background, we, we are from a holiness background, which at, at any given time, whether it was Wesleyan, whether it was Nazarene, um, uh, Assemblies of God, whether it was uh, Christian Missionary and Alliance, uh, we've all had a point in time in our history where a desire of separation has led to a list of rules. And now rules, well-meaning, and rules are not wrong, but we lost the teaching of this idea of holiness of heart. Because when you have holiness of heart, you don't need a checklist of rules. When you find yourself holy unto the Lord, right? Separate unto holiness, separate unto God and all in wonder that love grows our desire for obedience. But in a legalistic standpoint, we teach what to obey without teaching who to obey. We begin to teach the separate from something, separate from the world, without teaching first and primary the separation to God, that we are separation, separated to Him. We are separate unto God, who is our Lord and Master in the awe and wonder and love, grows our obedience. And we don't need no stinking checklist because our heart just cries out to do whatever God asks of us to do. Our separation is not a checklist, but it's a heart matter. It's not a reaction against but a response to. A, a checklist is a reaction against. We you know, draw a line in the sand and we can react against things in our world and say, don't do this, don't do that, right? I, I just go back in our history as a church. We used to say, don't wear wedding, wedding bands. Don't go to movies. Don't do, and it became this whole checklist of if you want to be good and holy, you put on all these things and you dress a certain way, act a certain way, say the certain things, but it was a reaction, a reaction against the world instead of teaching love and obedience and helping people respond to God's love. Therefore, holiness of heart enables us to obey. You see, it's not a mere determination to be different from the world, but it's a whole hearted desire to be like God, to seek his holiness, to find that in holiness I am putting on a shadow of the divine nature. And when I see myself as an example, as an ambassador of Christ, whew, there's a weightiness to that. And I don't want to let him down. I don't want to be the cause of somebody turning away from Christ because of my attitude. I don't want somebody to turn away from God's love because I had a bad day or because I live in a different way. It's not a mere determination to be different from the world, but a wholehearted desire to be like God, by obeying his words, obeying him. This is where it comes down to that whole, uh, I, I, you know, brings more meaning to Paul's statements in 1 Corinthians about meat. He goes, I don't have an issue eating the meat. It sacrificed an idol or not, it don't matter. It's meat. I can eat it. But if my actions were by any chance to cause someone to stumble, then I will never eat it again. I don't care how good it tastes. Because my obedience to the conviction of God goes above and beyond any checklist of rules ever could. We are called to be saints. We are called to be separate, but not separate from, separate to separate to, to live a life that is different, that is marked. The marks of Christ, like we said in Ephesians, of humility, of gentleness, of patience, 
and bearing with one another in love. In that idea, when we think about we are separate for his plans, his glory, his will, his praise, that changes our attitude when we go through dark times, doesn't it? When, when we go through a time of suffering, of pain, of grief, of sickness, it's easy when it's all about me to curse God. It's easy when it's all about me to doubt God. But when I am abandoned to the love, the obedience of God, and knowing that everything works together for good, his will, for his plan, and his strength. Because when we learn to love God, what's the commandment? Love God, then love others. But until you learn to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, you'll never truly learn to love others. To be a servant of all. So maybe you need to hear that. Remember that today. That your separation as a believer. It's not separation to a checklist. The checklist isn't wrong. The checklist isn't bad. All right. Um, this is not against you know the rules of um, guides to helps in holy living, as Wesleyans put it. And you know we have our own list in the Nazarene, very similar and. It's not that those are wrong at all. They aren't. But if you don't have the heart to obey, then you're not going to have the heart to obey the list. <laughs> Learn to love. Learn to obey. As you grow in of and then learn to give out because you are from Christ. So God, we love you. We praise you as you continue to help us unpack your word. Lord, help us to know that we are not separate from, but separate to. Separate to your glory, separate to your strength, separate to your will and to your plan. It's not my will, skill, strength. It's, it's yours. So God, may we seek to live unto holiness, not just holiness of character, but you as holiness, the divine nature of God that brings about conviction of sin, that brings about a willing, loving desire to seek to do right in all things because of a deep love of you. Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts. Burn away the dross. Burn away the, the sin in our lives. That sin that so easily entangles us. Help us to grow in that perseverance that comes when we love and learn to obey you, not out of have to, but out of love and desire to obey with all and wonder the holy, 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 God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. We love you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have a wonderful rest of the day.